Hello, I'm Petra Lewis in Dartmouth. This um, video covers some basic chest X-ray um, technique concepts before we move on to the chest X-ray anatomy series. Before you interpret a chest X-ray, some things you need to think about before you actually start looking for abnormalities. First of all, is it a PA or an AP chest X-ray? So what position was the patient imaged in? Is the study rotated? Is there adequate penetration? Have they taken a um, sufficient depth of inspiration? Did we include the intorthorax? We cut some of it off. Did the patient move during it? So these are basic image quality aspects. So let's start with looking for rotation. So the way we assess rotation in an adult is by looking at the um, anterior ends of the clavicles and their relationship to the um, thoracic uh, vertebral process, spinous process in between. So we want that distance to be equal on either side. Now just to note that in a kid, it's a little bit different. In kids, um, they are much rounder. They're a little bit more difficult to assess by this method. I'm talking about babies, really, um, not larger children. And they don't have really well ossified spinous processes for us and medial ends of the clavicles to us to be able to see this. So in a kid, I'm going to look differently. I'm going to look at the anterior ends of their ribs on either side and make sure that they look symmetrical like this. A kid who's rotated is going to have one side looking long and the other side being foreshortened. So let's look at this image pair. So this is a rotated image and this one is not rotated. So I'm going to zoom up um, a little bit so we can look at the medial ends of the clavicles. So this one here is the rotated one. And we can look here. Here is the medial end of the right clavicle. Here is the medial end of the left clavicle. And here is a spinous process, so clearly not central. The patient was imaged a few days later. And now this study is not rotated. See, these are really pretty symmetrical. Not perfect, but pretty good. So now let's look at the effects it has on both these chest x-rays. So don't forget this one on the left is the rotated one. And one of the things that you see here is the mediastinum can look much wider. And if it's really rotated, it can really actually kind of throw the ascending aorta off completely to the side and they look very funky. And the other thing that we notice is that there is this sort of diffuse haziness down one side um, of the hemithorax, it's always the downward side, and that's produced by the overlying soft tissues, producing some increased density on that side of the hemithorax. I'm just going to take my stuff off so you can see it better. And that's a classic appearance. Um, this was a totally normal chest x-ray, but you could you see how you could easily call that a left lower lobe pneumonia or something like that by that opacity down there. Um, here's a couple of days later. Um, she had had new treatment in between. Um, and you can now see that all of that haziness is completely gone. We could have repeated the chest x-ray immediately afterwards and had that same effect. The degree of inspiration can really produce a significant abnormality. Um, a good assessment for an adequate degree of, ins degree of inspiration is 10 posterior ribs down to the hemidiathrams. Remember posterior, not anterior. Um, having said that, um, somebody who's very young and fit with good aerobic capacity might be able to pull their diaphragms down to 12 posterior ribs. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily hyperinflated as long as they maintain a normal degree of um, curvature of their hemidiaphragms. Um, so these two chest x-rays here were on a morbidly obese patient. They're both AP chest x-rays and they were taken within 30 minutes of each other. And this one here had originally been read by my resident as being um, showing severe bilateral lower lobe pneumonias. And I said, well, you know, why don't we just get a better inspiration study? And you can see what's one here. The lung bases are now completely clear. You know, obviously, they didn't get better in that interval. So that just shows what a significant um, difference you can have with very low degrees of inflation. You're going to get a lot of vascular crowding. You can get basilar atelectasis. The vessels can look very big. The mediastinum can look very wide. So um, if you don't have an adequately inspired study, um, repeat it if you can. Now, what about penetration? Um, a good judgment for penetration is you should be able to see the thoracic spine. You know, see these uh, vertebral um, 
uh, posterior elements adequately through the mediastinum, but it shouldn't look like a thoracic spine film. You shouldn't be able to sit there and sort of see every little um, osteophyte there. So adequate degree of inspiration, you can see them. If it's underpenetrated, it's going to look too white, and you may miss subtle abnormalities in the lung. Um, you're also not going to be able to see things like um, um, lines and tubes very well because they're all going to be hidden within those mediastinal tissues. Overpenetrated studies can also make the visualization of lung abnormalities really quite difficult to see, um, and particularly things like a, a pleural line in a patient who has a pneumothorax is going to be very difficult to see if the whole of the lungs are black and you're looking for the black of the pleural space. Let's talk briefly about the um, standard projections for a chest X-ray. So um, these are the questions we're going to think about. Um, you know, how is a, a PA, posterior anterior chest X-ray, taken? And, and why do we even do it as a posterior anterior? Um, how do we take an AP1? And how are they going to look different? And which films are taken anterior-posterior? So I'm going to show you some pictures of how a PA chest X-ray is taken. But the basic concept is that the beam, the views are all named after how the x-ray beam travels. So in this case, the x-ray beam is going to travel from the posterior aspect of the patient through their back, through their anterior, and then go to the x-ray plate. Right? Now, why is this our standard way of doing chest x-rays? Well, it reduces the radiation exposure to anterior structures, and in particular, the thyroid and the breast. An AP chest x-ray, the x-ray beam is going to pass through the front of the patient, it's going to go to the back of the patient, and then go to the x-ray ones. And we'll see in a minute how they look different. Um, so which films are taken AP? Well, basically anything um, where the patient is not able to come to the x-ray department and is not usually able to stand up. We can do PAs occasionally um, with them sitting on a stool or chair, but they have to be at least reasonably mobile. So this is a patient having a uh, PA chest X-ray. So the X-ray beam here, here's the X-ray generator, is going from their posterior surface through their front and into the image receptor plate here. Notice how her arms are brought out to her side. Sometimes we put them holding up across the patient or up over the head. And this is to rotate the scapulae from outside of the field of view. A normal PA chest X-ray is taken at 72 inches distance between the X-ray generator plate here and the receptor here. So you can see here, normal PA chest X-ray, look how those scapulae, by moving the arms into those positions, have been moved out of the field of view. So they're not overlapping the lung tissue. This is a patient who is having a supine AP, so the X-ray beam is going from anterior to posterior into the image receptor back there. Portable chest X-rays or AP chest X-rays are usually taken with a much smaller distance than on the PAs, that's 40 inches, and um, this has some significance I'm going to show you in a minute. This patient's having a portable chest X-ray done on the unit, and this patient is semi-supine. So any chest X-ray that is done with a patient um, in the supine or the semi-supine or sitting up in a bed or portable chest x-ray, they will all by default be AP. Now they can be AP in the department, which means that they're done with good quality equipment, or they could be AP with portable equipment, which um, tends to be sort of, of lower power. Um, the effect of having the equipment done much closer to the patient um, in um, this case, for a portable film or a supine AP, as I just showed you, within the department, also has the effect of increasing scatter with the patient and making a lower quality chest X-ray. So if you are able to get your patient to the department, um, if they are well enough and stable enough to be able to leave the floor, you are going to get a much better chest X-ray. Even if we have to do it as AP with them sitting up on a stretcher, then you will um, if you have portable equipment come to the floor. So let's look at the effect of a PA versus an AP chest X-ray. So on this diagram here, here is our image receptor. Here's our patient and here's the heart. So this patient is, if their nose was here, they'd be facing 
um, the image receptor. So there's a PHS X-ray and the triangle at the top of the image is the X-ray beam. Now what I'm showing here is how their heart is going to project onto the image receptor. And let's compare that to how the outside of the body, outside the thorax, is going to project and just kind of have a guesstimate here on what this ratio is. So that's, this ratio is going to be about this much in my diagram. Okay. Now let's move across and look at an AP study. So here's a patient positioned for an AP study. Nothing else has changed, um, but this time the heart is going to be anterior. Um, because the patient is going to be facing in this direction here. And what you can see now is that that ratio is now completely different. So this ratio of the heart projection to the thorax projection is going to be significantly larger. So the heart is just being falsely magnified. Now the closer that the x-ray generator is to the patient, remember we said that portable studies were done at 40 inches rather than at um, 72 inches, so if we move our generator out to here, the greater that magnification effect is going to be. So these are two studies, PA and AP, done um, within a few minutes of each other, within an hour. The PA study was done upright standing, and the AP was done with the patient back in the department, um, but in this case, they were sitting up on a stretcher. So we're seeing a couple of different things here. Um, first of all, we're seeing that the um, heart looks larger on the AP study from that magnification view. So we're going to allow a cardiothoracic ratio of probably up to 0. Um, 0.6 rather than 0. 0.5 in this case. The whole of the mediastinum, in fact, looks larger. Now, that's partially an effect of it being an AP study, but it's also partially effect of the patient sitting up. When they sit up, they can't take such a good inspiration. That effect is even more profound when they're lying down. And that in itself, by just kind of squishing the mediastinum up, is going to make it look wider. So you have to kind of take those things into account when you're looking at a PA rather than a, an AP rather than a PA chest X-ray. All right, so let's move on to a lateral chest X-ray. So how do we take a lateral chest X-ray? And um, which side is going to be magnified because of how we take it? So just have a think about that for the moment before we go on. So in the lateral chest X-ray engaged, engage, um, this is our image receptor. This is our patient. This is their heart. The patient's left side is always the one that goes against the image receptor. Their right side is going to be further away. So in this case, the patient's right side is going to be magnified more than their left side. And um, if you watch my video on deciding which diaphragm is which, you'll see how we use this fact to our advantage. So here's a lateral chest X-ray. This is... So here's a lateral chest X-ray in the patient. I'm going to zoom up a little bit here. So we can look at the back side. Here is one set of ribs. Here's the other set of ribs, and see how this one is magnified? That's because that one is on the right. So this whole right hemithorax is magnified compared to the left. So decubitus views are labeled by the downside. So left lateral decubitus is left side down, and right lateral decubitus is the right side down. The two main things that we use decubitus views are for are to see if patient has an effusion, whether it's a mobile effusion, in which case we want to put the abnormal side down because the fluid falls. And what we want to do is layer the fluid against the chest wall to make it easier to see. We don't want to layer it against the mediastinum by doing it the other way around. That would be very um, confusing and you wouldn't be able to see it very well. If we want to see if someone has a pneumothorax, the other hand, we're going to put the abnormal side up air ascends. We want to see the air, the abnormality, against the chest wall. We don't want to put it against the mediastinum. Again, that would not be helpful in this situation. So, if we're wondering if the patient has a left-sided effusion, we will do a left lateral decubitus x-ray. If we're wondering if the patient has a right-sided pneumothorax, we're going to do a left lateral decubitus x-ray.
All right, does that make sense? Now, the vast majority of chest X-rays we're going to do on full inspiration. We want to inflate the lungs as much as possible because it's going to increase our sensitivity for seeing subtle abnormalities. But there are occasions when we actually want to do expiratory chest X-rays. There's really kind of two main reasons we do expiratory chest X-rays, with the first being the most common. We may want to do it to see if the patient has a pneumothorax. Um, and I'm showing you a couple of examples here. When you have a pneumothorax and you do an expiratory chest X-ray, you're going to do a couple of different things. One, you're going to make the lungs look more opaque. So the pneumothorax, which stays being loosened, you're going to see much clearer. The second thing that this does is while a small pneumothorax may be a little difficult to see, it's going to look bigger when you decrease the entire volume of the hemithorax. The lung gets smaller, but the volume of the pneumothorax stays the same, so its percentage is going to look larger. So this pneumothorax here looks a lot larger in this particular patient. The second reason that we may do an expiratory film is if we're looking for evidence of major bronchial obstruction through air trapping. And what we're going to do in that case is that we're looking on the expiratory film for signs of the normal lung to decrease in volume. But the lung that has, and this patient doesn't have one, this is a pneumothorax case, but the patient that has a goober sitting in one of its main bronchi cannot deflate that particular lung. So the lung will stay at the same volume with the, the abnormal lung. The normal lung will collapse and therefore there will be mediastinal shift away from the side of obstruction. All right, this is just a little bit of a 50,000 foot view um, of a, approach to interpreting chest x-rays. So you've gone through, you're deciding what view it was and whether the image quality was adequate, which we just talked about in a minute. The first thing you've got to decide is, is anything wrong? I mean, that sounds like a very simple question, but it's actually a very complex question. The first thing you have to um, decide is, is this a normal chest x-ray? So how do you decide your normal chest x-ray? The only way is by having an internal representation of a normal chest x-ray. The more you see, the better that representation is going to be because there is no one normal chest x-ray. There isn't a normal chest x-ray the same way as there is a, a circle. You can always look, see one circle and you can always recognize a circle, but you really need to see hundreds of chest x-rays to be able to identify What's a normal chest X-ray in a young patient, an old patient, a skinny patient, a obese patient, um, and so on. Um, once you've decided if something's wrong, you've got to decide where it is. Is it in the pleura? Is it in the lung parenchyma? Is it the mediastinum? Is it maybe not inside the chest at all, but perhaps it's part of the chest wall? You need to characterize the abnormality. Is it a mass? Is it fluid? Is it air? Is it airspace consolidation? Is it an interstitial abnormality? To know what produces that pattern, you have to have some knowledge of radiology, pathology correlation, and then you need to relate it to the history for often to make sense. And of course, being radiology, we often don't get the history. And then finally, is this something new or is it changed? And I'm not going through, I'm going through these on a very um, general form because they're covered in other teaching sessions. The next two videos that you should watch are the uh, one of normal lobe anatomy and then normal mediastinal anatomy. Thanks for listening.